Thank you very much. My name is Fred Kate. I'm a professor here at the Law School and Director of CLEAR. It's a pleasure to welcome you this evening to the presentation by Commissioner Julie Brill from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, Julie Brill was appointed by President Obama as co Commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission, and that took effect just almost two years ago now, so we're coming up to an anniversary. Since joining uh, the Commission, uh, uh, Ms. Brill has worked actively on a number of issues affecting consumers. Uh, reflecting the broad range of the Commission's mandate, including consumers' privacy, um, encouraging appropriate advertising substantiation, guarding consumers from financial fraud, and maintaining uh, competition in industries as diverse as high tech and healthcare. Uh, before she was a Commissioner, uh, Julie was Senior Deputy Attorney General and Chief of Consumer Protection and Antitrust for Nor the North Carolina Department of Justice, and before that, Assistant Attorney General for Consumer Protection and Antitrust in Vermont. That's where I first met you, when I think you were coordinating the state's attorneys general investigation into uh, security breaches. I think that was the first nationwide investigation into a security breach. She is one of our nation's leading experts on information privacy and security, as well as the recognized advocate for public service. Let me just say a, a, a word about the, the rest of her career. Prior to her work in the public sector, Commissioner Brill was an associate of Paul Weiss in New York, and she clerked uh, for the Vermont Federal District Court Judge uh, Franklin S. Billings, Jr. She graduated magna cum laude from Princeton University and attended New York University Law School, where she held a Ruth Tilden Scholarship for her commitment to public service. Now, I've known Julie for many years, and she is a remarkable person as well as an exceptional example of tough-minded but equally compassionate public service on both the state and federal level. It is a great pleasure to introduce her this evening, Commissioner Julie Brill. Thank you. So it's really nice to be here. I actually have some prepared remarks. We do this in Washington, and the producer wants to see what you're going to say. But then what I really want to do is open it up to questions, because I find that to be the most interesting part. And when we do open it up to questions, feel free to ask me anything. I may not answer, <laughs> but really anything, you know, what's it like to be a commissioner, what was it like to go through confirmation, whatever. Um, but it really is a pleasure to be here. I have never been to Indiana before um, at all. Um, and I certainly haven't been to Bloomington, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful campus. And it was certainly a beautiful day to come, and I know Fred specially ordered the weather for me, um, so it was really nice to be here. Um, I also had a chance to spend um, an afternoon with the Wells Scholars Program, with um, Fred's teaching, of course, over there. And boy, that was really interesting. Those kids are incredibly bright. And they had some very interesting, innovative ideas. And I know, of course, you don't want them to outshine you. So I'm going to hear lots of innovative things from you as well. So now I'm not going to tell you how many years. We already stipulated. I'm not telling you how many years I've known Fred. I'm also not going to tell you how many years it's been since I graduated from law school, but let's just say it's been many. And um, but being here really does bring back memories. It really brings back some good memories and some not so good memories. Um, you know, I always had those terrors that I'm sure all of you had when you were one else. How many here are one else? Anybody? Oh yeah. Okay. But you're in your second semester, right? So you're old hands. Right? <laughs> but right, sure, exactly, sure. I just remember really well how um, I would kind of hold my breath whenever the professor was kind of looking around the room for someone to pick on. Um, I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to do that tonight. But um, I'll just wait for you to raise your hand and ask questions at the end, and then we'll talk. Um, what I thought I would do is, is introduce you to the Federal Trade Commission, what the Federal Trade Commission is. Um, what we think about what we do in Washington, and then tell you a little bit about one of my, the, the issues that is very near and dear to my heart, as well as being near and dear to the heart of the agency, and that's something that Fred alluded to, which is privacy. So the Federal Trade Commission is run by five commissioners. Um, we are bipartisan, meaning that no more than three commissioners comes from any one party, any one political party. We're also independent. Um, that means that once the commissioners are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate, we cannot be removed. I mean, I think we can be removed if we like break laws or something like that. But generally speaking, we can't be removed. Um, we, our mandate, the Federal Trade Commission's mandate, is to protect consumers, make sure they're not cheated in the marketplace or misled in the marketplace through advertising or other activities. 
And we also protect competition. It's an unusual combination where we do both consumer protection and competition enforcement. And in our competition sphere, what we do is we make sure that the marketplace is offering up a wide range of goods and services at the fairest price. So we tackle some pretty interesting and tough issues. Um, on the competition side, we deal with fast moving, high tech, healthcare, high tech industry, the healthcare industry. We focus on anti competitive practices. We also focus on mergers and merger reviews. So when two companies are going to merge and they're of a certain size, we review that to see whether it's going to be anti-competitive. Um, and, and, and most of the antitrust work that we do um, is pretty complicated litigation. On the consumer protection side, in addition to privacy, which I'll talk some more about, we do, we do credit reporting enforcement, we do advertising substantiation, negative option billing, debt collection, telemarketing. Um, we run the nation's do not call list. Maybe some of you signed up for that, I don't know. Um, which is the way that consumers, it allows consumers to opt out of annoying telemarketing calls. And its claim to fame um, is that it is the government program that Dave Barry has called the most popular since the Elvis stamp. And I'm very proud of that. So it is, it is a very popular so I was appointed to be a commissioner as, as um, Professor, I guess I should call you Professor Kate in this context, I'm sorry. As Professor Kate pointed out, I was appointed a commissioner um, of the Federal Trade Commission in 2010. Um, and prior to my confirmation uh, by the Senate, I did work um, in the state attorney general world doing um, law enforcement at the state level, consumer protection and antitrust work, first in Vermont, for many, many years, over 20 years, and then for one year in North Carolina. Um, so as a state enforcer, I worked with consumers, with businesses, with state agencies, and I did it in a very up-close and personal way. It's different than being at the federal level. Um, I would uh, sometimes work to get refunds to consumers who were scammed by a particular practice or you know, a, a, a deceptive act or something like that. Sometimes I would look at, at privacy policies, sometimes I'd look at data breach um, uh, issues, as Fred mentioned. And sometimes I would just provide practical advice, whether it was antitrust or <coughs> consumer protection, but practi practical advice to state agencies. Because what state attorneys general do is they're not only um, prosecuting cases on behalf of consumers or on behalf of the state, in the consumer protection, environmental, civil rights, or competition realm, but they also represent the state. They sort of have to wear both hats, and they'll represent the state both in terms of advising the state and also in terms of representing them in court. So it's sort of an interesting um, dichotomy uh, or dual set of roles that state attorneys general play. And again, you can talk more about that during uh, you know, the end part if you guys are interested. Um, I was first introduced to privacy issues. Uh, it was almost my first day when I moved over to the Consumer Protection Division in the Vermont Attorney General's office. Um, what had happened was a group of Vermont consumers um, from small towns in, all over Vermont had found out, and these were consumers that were coming from all walks of life. It wasn't um, one particular economic group. It was really, it spanned all the rich, the poor, middle class, and from many towns, discovered that they were being rejected for mortgages and refinancing. And they couldn't figure out why, so they were starting to call the state AG's office and they were complaining about it. And while I, I, I got assigned to this, I said, Julie, this will like, be good for you. Why don't you do this? Um, and I actually thought it was really interesting. And I started um, working with town clerks and talking to them about what seemed to be happening. And it, uh, it seemed, what we, fig what we figured out was that credit reporting agencies were listing consumers who had in fact paid their taxes as not having paid them because they were misreading the, ta the town records. They were just not understanding. In Vermont, a tax lien is, is, given, is issued to everybody. Um, and when you pay your taxes, then you paid your taxes. But they were misunderstanding what the word lien meant um, in, in Vermont. So bottom line, entire towns were being listed falsely as tax deadbeats. And that doesn't do you too much good when you're trying to apply for a mortgage or you know, a, a refinancing. 
So that was probably that was my first experience in this in this world of data protection and privacy. And what I learned um, through that process was how inaccurate information about consumers can really have harmful consequences, and that it is important for people in positions like the position I was in or the position I'm currently in to try to work to set things right for consumers. So one of the things I did um, way back when uh, was, you know, I, I worked to resolve the, the case involving Vermont with respect to all three of the major credit reporting agencies. I also was asked to testify um, in the U.S. House of Representatives and in the Senate about some of these issues because at the same time that Vermont was experiencing this, this problem, um, actually the credit reporting agencies were believed to be having problems countrywide throughout the entire nation. And um, the Vermont story became kind of a, a catalyst, not the only one by any means, but one of the catalysts towards um, enacting uh, uh, revisions to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the first time actually that the law had been revised in 25 years. So that was the 1996 revisions to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Now as Fred mentioned, um, well, he mentioned that I, le I then led the state's uh, privacy working group, the working group of the state attorneys general that were focused on privacy and data security. But it was really that one, that one case that led to all of this, that led to my interest in this area, that led me to, to sort of think, wow, you know, something that consumers have no control over, have no information about, can really deeply, deeply affect their lives. So as the coordinator for the National Association of Attorneys General, um, privacy working group. I dealt with all forms of uh, data breach issues that the states were working on, the legislation that the states have enacted. There is no federal law dealing with uh, data breach notifications. It's all at the state level. Um, I testified in Washington about some other issues. And I got to know national leaders um, in the privacy and data protection realm, including um, Professor Kate. That's how I got to know him. So now uh, I'm a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. I do continue to serve consumers in as much of a hand-on way as I can. For me, frankly, that's really the best way that I can do my job, because I view my job as protecting consumers. I think that's what the Federal Trade Commission um, should be doing. Um, and uh, that really has been our mission since, since 1914. That's when the Federal Trade Commission was founded. And how we came about is actually fairly interesting. I don't know how many people... Are you guys all professors? Mm -hmm. no. Professor in another school. Okay. You looked not like law students. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. You were trying to fly below the radar. You didn't make it. You yeah. didn't make it. You didn't make it. <laughs> you didn't make it. So, but I, I was turning to them because I'm not even sure if you all know the story of how the Federal Trade Commission came about. So many people don't. So what happened was... And not that you all wouldn't, but like they should know. <laughs> totally calling everybody out here. Um, it, it's, it's actually a fairly interesting story. Woodrow Wilson made um, the 1912 election about uh, one of the big issues in the 1912 presidential election. So this is an, a presidential election 100 years ago. Was about trusts and monopolies and whether or not uh, trusts were becoming a problem, a big problem in this country. And he won, in part, there are lots of reasons why anyone wins the presidency, but he won in part because of this issue, this issue regarding monopolies and trusts and whether or not they are appropriately being handled under the, under the case law that was coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court. So um, Louis Brandeis was... Um, a colleague of his and worked with him on this issue during the presidential election. And after Woodrow Wilson won, he asked Louis Brandeis to figure out what specific recommendations could be made to try to deal with the problem of the trusts, which again, as I said, at least you know, President um, Wilson at the time said this, this is the, one of the major problems in the nation. So Brandeis, Louis Brandeis was the one who conceived of the Federal Trade Commission. And he thought it should empower, the, that Congress should empower the Federal Trade Commission to investigate and prohibit unfair methods of competition. Later on, we got our consumer protection mandate, but we first started out essentially as an agency that was going to focus on unfair and deceptive, um, uh, I'm sorry, unfair methods of competition. 
And we were given a very broad and a very flexible mandate, wide-ranging powers to do investigations, wide-ranging powers to seek um, remedies, um, although not monetary remedies. Penal civil money penalties is not something that we typically are able to um, obtain in many of our cases, unless all the exceptions apply, and I won't go into this now. But, it, but, but, uh, but we really are um, an agency that was designed to have wide-ranging powers, including investigatory powers. Now, of course, Louis Brandeis was later on nominated um, by um, uh, Wilson to become a Supreme Court Justice, and he went on to become one of our most famous jurists. And it's, really, it's not coincidental, in my view, that one of um, Louis Brandeis's big issues was, of course, privacy. Um, he was one of our most influential thinkers about privacy. And interestingly, his engagement with the issues around privacy and um, his concerns about modernizing the law really stem from things that he was seeing during his day and age about new technologies that, that he found to be troubling at that time, back again in 1912, 1912. Well, like 1906 through about 1920. His famous article, um, The Right to Privacy, successfully advocated for the creation of a tort for the breach of privacy. And what it focused on, if you go back and you read it, it's actually, it's not really written in the best prose, so maybe you'll read it, but it's a little turgid. Um, but he, what he does focus on is what he called the then revolutionary phenomenon of snapshot photography, which he said, and I'm going to quote, he said, it um, allowed the press to overstep in every direction the obvious bounds of propriety and decency. This is a snapshot photography. And then in Olmsted versus United States, um, that was a case that um, involved uh, what was then the, the very new technology of wiretaps. Um, he issued his famous and very influential dissent where he argued that against the government, Americans have the right to be left alone. Well, the internet revolution that we are all living, as we are a part of and participating in, and it is occurring right now, when you think about it, it makes snapshot photography and wiretap technology look like child's play, right? As Brandeis did in his day when he was thinking about new technologies and what the relationship should be between um, government companies, the, the private companies, and consumers and individuals, so too we at the Federal Trade Commission, we're examining today's technologies and we're trying to look at how consumers are using them and how they're impacting consumers' privacy. One of the most significant developments that I see uh, in today's uh, society is the vast amounts of information that are being collected about consumers and, and being amassed about consumers. Whether we're talking about social media, whether we're talking about online activities, geolocation information, information, this information about consumers is being collected, culled, dissected, and cataloged. And the catchy term for this these days is what's known as big data. And maybe you guys talk about this in some of your class, maybe some of you are taking Professor Kate's various courses. I know this is an issue that's, of, um, that's a hot topic now um, in many places, both here and in Europe, actually. So recently there was an article in the New York Times Magazine section regarding targets and what targets was doing with shoppers' information. Did any of you guys see that article? Yeah? So I'm seeing a bunch of people? Okay. Did anyone not see it? Who wants to? Okay. So for you, I will explain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and kudos to you for being brave enough to say it. you did not see it. Um, so what Targets did was um, it developed a methodology to determine whether a woman was pregnant. And it did this by taking innocuous pieces of data. We're not sure of exactly what pieces of data. I will speculate that it was pieces of data like um, whether, uh, well, first, first, it, first what it did is it analyzed uh, shoppers, women shoppers, um, to determine what purchases they made before they became, um, they had their baby, okay? And it was taking innocuous pieces of data. Now, we don't know what pieces of data those were, but I'm guessing it was things like a pregnancy test, and then maybe later on purchase of newborn diapers, 
right? And then backfilling to look back at what, what, what women, those women fought prior to the time they delivered their baby. And by looking, by sifting through lots of information about lots of their female shoppers who ultimately they determined actually did deliver a baby, Target, Targets was able to create a pregnancy predictor score. And then apply that pregnancy predictor score not to women who did in fact deliver a baby later on, but actually to women who were apparently newly pregnant. And the reason it did this is because uh, Target st has determined that, um, as any retailer might, that people who are going through major life changes um, will uh, typically change their shopping habits at the same time. And it's a really good time to market to people. So what Target's did is it, it developed this pregnancy predictor score and it was issuing coupons to um, uh, women who, who scored high on the pregnancy predictor score. Um, and, and women were receiving coupons for things that were obviously for, for pregnant women and were kind of getting freaked out by it. They're like, how, do, how does, why does Targets know that I'm pregnant? Because it would, you know, this would happen very early on in the term of their pregnancy. And so then Targets decided, according to this article, to, to sort of mask what they knew, to hide what they knew, and put those coupons in among lots of other coupons, knowing that the woman might be very attracted to these, pregnant, these coupons for pregnant women maybe vitamins, lotions, things like that. But it would be so obvious that Targets had actually figured out that they were pregnant. Really, really interesting issues surrounding um, that scenario. Um, and so the Targets Pregnancy Predictor Score um, you know, is, is just one of the things that we've been reading about that sort of touch, touch on consumers' privacy and touch on issues that we as a society need to really be thinking about in terms of how we want to handle these kinds of situations going forward. Other things that we've heard a lot about, you know, massive data, data breach at Sony PlayStation involving millions and millions of PlayStation uh, users. Ubiquitous collection of information from your smartphone. Um, you know, you all have read about this. You're walking around, your smartphone may not even uh, be on, but the data that um, indicates where you have been, the geolocation information, once you turn your smartphone on, can be sent back to the mothership, as it were. Um, all sorts of issues involving um, leakage of information like contact lists, uh, the apps that you have on your cell phone, your smartphone can leak contact list information. All sorts of issues that are arising on, you know, if not a daily basis, a weekly basis, that we at the Federal Trade Commission are thinking about how should we be handling this in our society? Do our laws, does our framework for dealing with privacy adequately address these issues? Um, and I really view that as our job. I view that as our job to keep pace with what's happening in the technological world and how it impacts consumers. And, and we, we are, that's what we're doing. We're doing it through our enforcement actions, and we're doing it through some of our policy initiatives. So I thought I'd take a few minutes to talk to you a little bit about some of the stuff we're doing, focusing in on these, on these problems. Um, so we've got a bunch of law enforcement cases that we brought against companies that we believe failed to protect the vast amount of information um, that's held by consumers, including sometimes sensitive financial information. Um, we brought law enforcement actions against companies that disclosed personal data that consumers expected to be private, and it wasn't private. We took action, against, for instance, we took action against Twitter, a very well-known social media service, when it made some of its uh, private tweets public. Um, but two of the big actions that we've recently taken, and I'm sure some of you have heard about it, or heard about them, was we entered into settlements with both Facebook and Google. Um, and I thought I would take a minute to talk about those settlements because they do teach some sort of interesting lessons. Um, our complaint against Facebook alleged that, a num that they were involved with a number of deceptive uh, and unfair practices in violation of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Um, the practices included uh, uh, that Facebook had made information about users that users had designated private had made that information public. Um, we also talked about uh, Facebook's failure to keep some of the promises that it had made to consumers um, on, through its privacy policies. It had told users that it wouldn't share information with advertisers, but then it did share information. 
and uh, the company had said it would take down photos and videos of users that had deleted their accounts, but then it didn't take down that information. Um, so the proposed settlement with, that we entered into with Facebook, it's still not final. Um, we go through a process where we propose settlements and then they're up for public comment and then, and then we finalize them. Um, so the proposed settlement requires uh, Facebook to obtain affirmative express consent before it can share users' information in a way that exceeds the consumer's privacy settings. We also are requiring Facebook to delete, uh, to block access to information that their users delete. Um, one of the more innovative aspects of this settlement is we also require Facebook to implement a comprehensive privacy program that an independent auditor will monitor for 20 years. Now that's a concept that we borrowed from our data security cases, um, where if someone was involved with the data breach that we felt um, warranted uh, law enforcement action because they weren't, they didn't have data security that was sufficiently robust in light of the, the reasonable practices in the industry. If we entered into a consent decree with a company like that, we would require that they enter into, they have a data security uh, program and that that program be monitored by an independent auditor for 20 years. So we've taken that data security concept and we have now placed it into the privacy bucket, if you will. So Facebook is um, going to be, and Facebook, you know, entered into the settlement um, and, you know, uh, agreed to the terms that we asked them to agree to, and so now they're going to be moving forward to comply. Um, our settlement with Google uh, arose from um, Google's first social media product, which was called Google Buzz. Um, it was a short-lived product. Um, <laughs> Uh, and what we, we believed that Google uh, didn't give its <coughs> Gmail users good ways to stay out of or leave Google Buzz. Um, and that was in violation of Google's privacy policies. And, um, you know, consumers who, I don't know how many of you experienced this, who were Gmail users when Google Buzz was launched. Were any of you? Did this happen to any of you? Yeah? Okay. It happened to me. So, because I'm a Gmail user. Um, but you sort of like suddenly found that you, bless you, you suddenly found that you were part of Google Buzz, and it wasn't easy to get out of it. The controls weren't easy in terms of, in terms of um, uh, telling consumers, you know, how they could limit the personal information that, that, that Google was going to start um, sending out through the social media service. We, um, we also said that the company did not adequately disclose to users that the identity of individuals who users most frequently emailed could be made public by default. That was one of the, the big issues. So, um, you know, if you were a doctor and you were emailing a patient, or if you were a, um, a someone who has a job but you were looking for a new job and you were talking to someone about a new job, those email contacts, if they were your then frequent email contacts, were made public suddenly. And that, you know, for some people was a real problem. Like scenarios I just mentioned, and you can imagine lots of others. So we entered into a settlement with Google, and um, like the Facebook settlement, Google is now um, required to obtain consumers' express affirmative consent before sharing information in a way that's materially different from its current privacy policies. And like Facebook, it has to implement a comprehensive privacy program that's again going to be monitored for 20 years. So. Um, the, in a, these are some of the big law enforcement cases. We've got lots of other law enforcement <coughs> cases. But one of the very interesting things that's occurring now, in addition to our law enforcement work, is we're very deeply involved in a policy initiative, which um, entails in many ways rethinking the privacy framework that we use here in the United States. We issued um, a report. Um, well, let me take a step back and say, you know, why, why did we do this? Why did we start thinking? about the need to rethink privacy. Well, you know, I've talked about some of the technology issues that we're facing. Think about a privacy notice. We were talking about this actually in the, with the, the undergrads, the seniors who are in the Wells program. Think about your typical privacy notice. You know, it's great to go to law school. I support law schools. 
but consumers shouldn't have to go to law school to be able to understand a privacy policy, right? I mean, it's just they, they have become way too legalistic um, and they aren't focused on trying to communicate in the way that marketing messages are designed to communicate. They're not really designed to communicate to consumers key information at a time when the consumers need it. Similarly, think about a privacy policy on a, on a smartphone. I mean, the world is moving to mobile. Everything that we're focused, we're thinking a lot about mobile issues. But just the one issue to talk for a minute, just to highlight one of the reasons why we're rethinking our privacy framework, thinking about a privacy notice on a smartphone, you know, we counted some notices like require, you know, 150 click-throughs to get through the legalistic form of the privacy notice. That just doesn't work. That's just not the right framework. So what we did is we issued, we, we, we tried to sort of say, given new technologies, given the kinds of, the ways consumers are interacting with these technologies, given the need to communicate information so that, to consumers so that they have notice and, sh and some kind of choice about information collection practices, we started to rethink how we do notice and choice and, and other aspects of privacy in this country. So we issued a draft report in December of 2010, so about a year, and, not quite a year and a half, about a year and a half, four months ago. And this was a framework where we were, we were proposing setting out um, principles that were going to be best practices for industry to engage in, but also the report is designed to be um, a framework for policymakers, whether the policymakers are in Washington or whether the policymakers are in state capitals. So anyone looking at legislation, thinking about privacy issues, this was designed for, to, to drill down and give them information about what are the issues that they should be thinking about. So I, I thought I would just briefly talk a little bit about the framework that we developed. Now, the, the final report um, is actually going to be uh, due, coming out really, really soon. Um, uh, I, I'm not supposed to say the exact date, but it's really soon. <laughs> So, um, it, but, but, so right now what I'm going to talk about is the proposed framework, not the final framework. But we did receive um, over, you know, it was like 450 comments, very detailed, substantive comments from all the big companies, all the consumer groups, from foreign governments, foreign data protect, protection authorities. We received many detailed comments about our proposed framework, and that's why it took over a year to analyze them and figure out what we wanted to, what we wanted to propose for a final framework. But again, since it's not out, I'm going to focus on, tell you about the proposed framework. So we set out three principles. The first one is privacy by design. This principle was designed and is designed to encourage industry to build privacy and security protections into new products and not wait until there's a privacy disaster to address problems. So for example, what we are asking companies to do is to examine the information they collect about consumers and determine, do they really need to collect it? Like if you're running an app that's a game, do you need to collect geo, you know, a game that doesn't involve where the consumer actually is, do you need to collect geolocation information? Or if you're running some other kind of app that, you know, whatever, maybe it, maybe it, or an app that tells a consumer about a restaurant that might be nearby, do you need to also download contact lists? No, no. Un undoubtedly you don't. So to, to really examine the information that's being collected and determine whether you actually do need it. Um, and equally important to determine how long they're retaining data and figure out whether such data retention is really necessary. Okay, um, I see I'm blathering on, so I'm going to try to go through the rest of this kind of quickly so we can get to, uh, to more of the discussion. The second principle, so that's the first principle, privacy by design. The second principle is simpler choice. So I talked about the problems with, with the notices that are provided to consumers. What we, what we proposed is figuring out a way to offer simpler choice to um, consumers. One of the things we talk about is layered notices so that consumers get a brief, like you're about, you're about to um, download this app, this app collects geolocation information. You know, do you want to do that? Really brief bits of information to consumers 
just in time so they can react to it, and then giving them more information if they want to get more information later on. But that's what's known as layered notices. We also had a proposal, have a proposal dealing with do not track mechanisms. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard about do not track. Um, it's all anyone talks about in Washington. Mm -hmm. So I, and as, as Professor Kate and I were talking about, there's a certain myopia in Washington. And I don't want to pretend that things that are talked about there are necessarily talked about everywhere else. But um, do not track is essentially a mechanism that we proposed at the Federal Trade Commission for industry to design mechanisms that would give consumers choices about whether their online activities across websites, not necessarily within one website, but across various websites, can be collected and used for marketing to them, or for other purposes. So it would give consumers a choice about that uh, collection across websites. Okay, so that's the second principle, simpler choice. Third principle is um, greater transparency. Uh, what, we are, what we propose is that, is that companies should provide consumers with more information about what is being done with their personal information. And I could go on and on about this issue, and I've written up stuff about this issue, but you see I'm turning the pages. It, it deals with the data broker industry and whether they're giving um, adequate access, whether consumers know who they are, whether consumers are given adequate access to their information, and if the information is being used for their substantial benefits, whether they're given correction <coughs> rights, access to correction rights. Um, but a very, very interesting issue, very near and dear to my heart, all comes under the concept of transparency. Do consumers know who's even collecting their information, and do they have access to it, and in appropriate circumstances, the ability to correct it? Okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, um, we so in addition to the work that we're doing at the Federal Trade Commission, we also are seeing a lot of other activity around privacy. Um, I'm sure many of you know that the U.S. Department of Commerce um, engaged in an, in an initiative to develop a framework that would set forth companies' obligations and companies' obligations and consumer rights with respect to personal information. The White House, building on what the Department of Commerce did, recently released a report outlining the White the administration's proposal, which contained a proposal for a consumer bill of rights. Private, excuse me, a consumer privacy bill of rights. Um, we, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, and the Department of Commerce have been working together on our two different in initiatives. They're not exactly the same, but they're very complementary. The um, uh, Department of Commerce does talk about this uh, Privacy Bill of Rights. They talk about um, baseline legislation, proposing baseline legislation uh, for Congress to enact. And they also talk about a multi-stakeholder process to develop codes of enforceable codes of conduct that companies would adhere to and that we at the Federal Trade Commission would enforce. Our report is really designed to sort of drill down into what some of the concepts that are talked about in the Privacy Bill of Rights uh, what, what, what those concepts really mean, things like notice, like choice, like collection, things like that. So they're very complementary um, uh, uh, processes. And we're going to work together, and we're going to uh, work together moving forward um, on, on the, the two projects. Now, um, while all this is going on in the United States, there's Europe. And um, Europe has also been engaged in a similar <coughs> examination this year of um, privacy issues. Uh, most notably, the EU, the European Union, um, has issued a um, proposed, uh, well, they issued a report, and they also issued recently a pro proposed regulation that would govern the entire EU dealing with privacy issues. And it's detailed, it's complex, we could go into it if you want to talk about it. But we've been working, we at the Federal Trade Commission, we've been working with our European counterparts um, so that we can each benefit from what's happening both sides of the pond and figure out how our two systems, which are not the same, but how they can best be made to be interoperable. So that companies that do operate in a global sphere can operate, you know, they, they can actually operate globally and can transfer data under appropriate circumstances and with appropriate monitoring, they can transfer data within their within their corporate structure. So 
I've been talking a lot about privacy, and I've been talking a lot about issues dealing with the Federal Trade Commission. And you all are probably sitting there thinking, so what does this mean for me? And that's a really good question. Law students, you should, you all, not you guys, you all should be asking that question a lot, all the time. Whenever someone like me comes in, or anyone comes in, what does it mean for you, and what does it mean for your life? So I'm sort of known for, in all of my talks, um, bringing in the movies, because I'm a total filmographer, you know, or a movie, movie holic, whatever. I don't want to use the more fancy words for it. I love movies. And um, this situation that I, that I want to close with really reminds me of the movie <coughs> The Graduate. How many of you have seen The Graduate? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to you guys. How many of you have seen it? I put my glasses on. Oh, wow. So actually, fair number. Okay, so it's on Netflix. So for those of you who haven't seen it, you can get it on your smartphone. You can download it. You can watch it. You can do the two-inch thing. You can do the laptop thing. You can do the TV thing. It's a great movie. In it, Dustin Hoffman is a recent um, college grad. And uh, his parents are throwing a cocktail party. And uh, all these people are coming up to him and telling him what he should do with his life. So those of you who've seen this movie know the scene I'm going to, right? Where this one guy comes up to him and says uh, to the Dustin Hoffman character, who's like this bewildered, you know, 60s kind of kid, he says, he says plastic. Plastics. There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Right? So here I am, and I'm telling you. You, the future lawyers of the world, you, the future at least law, law school graduates of the world, but certainly those of you who might be interested in something like this, I'm here to tell you privacy. There's a great future in privacy. <laughs> think about it. Will you? <laughs> Thanks. That's it. But now we get to the fun part, and I don't know how much time we have, but I am more than happy to chat about anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you share your thoughts on Google Space and Chains for privacy policy, which to me goes against your do not track principle in big ways? So, or at least a way to circumvent it using clever tricks. Do you know, by the way, I don't know, do I need to repeat the question for the video, or do we not worry about it? Okay. So it's a per perfectly great question. Um, can't answer that because you know we have our law enforcement side, and um, I, I, I really shouldn't answer it. Um, it's a great question. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen in these large <coughs> platform providers. There's a lot of activity that we look at or don't look at. So I'm sorry, I, I, I really can't say anymore. But it, but a very fair question. I think you were you were next. And we'll go down. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, all these conveniences of um, information have very strict policies on ownership of what you put up. Is that a violation of federal trade laws? Like they say, we everything you put up on the web, like let's say YouTube or Google, we own. We can do what we want with it. That doesn't seem right to me. You're the originator of whatever it is, a short or a plain description, and they claim they own the that well, interestingly, so so without getting into who owns it, certainly we've taken the position, and part of the Facebook proposed settlement takes the position that if a user has placed information on his or her page and then decides that they he or she wants to delete that information, that Facebook has to honor that request. So I do think that that's an important aspect of what you're talking about. But if you have something up there, who owns it? Uh, you know, I, would, I, I haven't looked at the privacy policy with respect to that issue. What we're focused on isn't so much ownership issues as do consumers have adequate controls. And that was an aspect of the Facebook settlement that we were very concerned about. The consumers wanted to take down information and the information wasn't being, wasn't being taken down. Yeah. We, we'll go these two and then we'll come back. Yeah, so go ahead. Uh, Since you were the brave one who admitted, you know, not, not having read the article. Um, is, the, are, is your agency concerned, I guess, at all with uh, public education at all? Because when you mentioned the settlement with Facebook, I imagine as soon as it's implemented, Facebook throwing up a pop-up that says, do you uh, affirmatively consent to this? And everyone just clicking accept and continuing about their business. Yeah, um, so 
there's a lot of, it's a very interesting space to work in because, you know, there's, there's sort of your average consumer and then there's the activist <coughs> consumers. And then there are the activist consumers who sort of just blog and tweet and talk about things. And, and I'm not sure that companies are as easily able to do what you, what you ended your question with, just do a pop-up and then everything's going to go forward um, because of, you know, pe people really watching this space and watching what they're doing. But, but you started out by asking about consumer education, and that is a really important aspect of, of what we do. We actually have a very large consumer education function, and we, we have um, a great uh, book that um, has actually been dis distributed uh, seven, I think it's up to about eight million times to schools. We're focused on, you know, um, junior high and high school kids, and it's called Netcetera. And it's actually, it's designed both for parents, well, for parents, teachers, and for kids to figure out how to be safe online. Um, so, yeah, there's a really important role for consumer education. Um, but as I was saying earlier today, I think consumer education is part of the answer to dealing with privacy. But I think another aspect of it is to not make things so difficult for consumers. You know, there's the phrase about the dashboard, right? What's on the dashboard and giving consumers choices. Well, at some point, consumers are going to have so many choices that they're simply overwhelmed. So what I urge companies to do is think about the dashboard, yes, be clear and all that on the dashboard, but also look under the hood and build privacy under the hood and build privacy into your products and services so it doesn't require, like I said, we don't want consumers to have to go to law school to understand privacy notices. We don't want consumers to have to be engineers to figure out how to get around collection of information that they don't want, for instance, their ISP to collect, right? So, so um, consumer education is incredibly important, but it's also important for companies to step up and try to building these things in to make it easier for consumers to maneuver through the space. Yeah, uh, my question was related somewhat to the previous one, and, and it also, I think, relates to this, and it, it might be a combination of both data security and uh, uh, building privacy under the hood. Uh, when Facebook does honor your request to delete your information, typically digital information isn't really destroyed. In other words, are, is the mandate that they go and then actually wipe things out, or are they simply, in technical terms, you know, deleting a pointer to where the information is, and now it might still be there? I understand. Yeah. I understand your question very well. Um, I so I think. I don't have the settlement for me, but my recollection is it requires that the information can no longer be accessed as opposed to it disappearing. So that, you know, that, that's answering your question, right? Um, so, yeah. There's a lot of talk about giving <coughs> consumers more um, information when they consent to something, mm -hmm. but I was wondering if there's any momentum behind the idea of giving consumers less ability to consent to things that they may not understand, and more behind the idea of letting the FTC regulate it in the same manner that like maybe the FDA does, where they have certain principles that they enforce strictly through regulation and not through consumer consent. It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that raises sort of some complicated issues in the sense, it, it's not, I can't just say yes or no to that, right? I mean, there are some ways in which, again, like privacy by design, we're trying to say companies should be more proactive and, and not just make this a matter of whatever you put in your privacy policy is going to be okay because consumers will be deemed to have consented. We, we do focus in the draft privacy report on certain circumstances where we think heightened protections are needed or express affirmative consent is needed. Like, for instance, sensitive information about kids, about health, about financial issues, there we're saying, you know, more is needed than, than um, although that's still consent. So, I'm, so, so you're saying, like, could we just ban certain practices the way the FDA, for instance, would ban a product that isn't deemed to be safe? Or, or also maybe base it off of, like you mentioned, that Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. Right. If there was a bright line, right. you are not allowed to do this, and the FTC was given enforcement ability, then right. it seems like it would be more effective that way. I, I think the area where that where we come closest to that, I mean, there are there are practices that we 
than if they haven't been done the right way, right? So if you change, if you use information that you said you were going to use for one purpose and then retro and then you, you retroactively start saying, well, no, we're going to actually use that information for different purposes, purpose, we say, no, you can't do that. But we do say, okay, but if you get consent and it's really informed and robust, that might be different. But I think probably the area that comes closest to what you're talking about would be data security practices more than privacy, where we say companies have to have reasonable security in light of the information that they're collecting. I think that's closer to the FDA example. But you know, you're raising an issue just by mentioning the FDA. You know, a lot of people, when they talk about these simpler notices for consumers, simpler information, you all know about the um, NLEA, the, the nutrition labeling, um, uh, in for the nutrition labels that appear on almost every food product that consumers <coughs> purchase. There are some people that think that notices should be like that. They should be uniform, they should be clear, they should um, uh, to give key information, no more, no less. And again, that's sort of a very regulatory approach. And there, so there is a lot of discussion about that. I don't think I gave a really good answer to your question because it's a pretty complicated question. But I don't think we're, I don't think we, you know, there are certainly areas where we're going to say certain things just shouldn't happen. Um, uh, but, it, but I'm thinking it tends to be more in data security. Yeah. First of all, thanks for calling me. Um, sure. My question has to do with the, uh, the third problem, the transparency. Sure. And um, specifically, I, I want to talk about credit reporting, yes. consumer protection, because I think I'm as protective of my credit report as I am my little sister. And at the end of the day, though, no one really knows what goes into your credit report. And there's Equifax, TransUnion, Experian. Um, something so important is your credit report and you know, debt and getting loans and kind of put us where we are now. Shouldn't that be something that people kind of are more knowledgeable about and educate them more about because it's probably the single most important tool. And uh, so I couldn't agree with you more and the fact that you're more protective, you're at, did you say as protective or more protective? Uh, it's, it's a toss up. It's a toss up. Yeah. <laughs> well, good kudos to you, yeah. um, both in terms of you, how you are as a brother and how you are as a consumer. Um, credit reports are incredibly, incredibly important and um, you know what, uh, policymakers have done is they've um, required credit reporting agencies to give free copies of a credit report to a consumer at least once a year. In some states, you can get it twice a year. So um, that is a tool that consumers, it's completely underutilized by consumers. Um, you can actually see your credit report. Uh, and they're also, and for free. I mean, it doesn't cost you anything. You can see it once a year, and, you, and the purpose of seeing a credit report is to make sure that the information is accurate. Because if decisions are being made about you um, based on your credit report, and a score is built on what's in your credit report, so it's either what's in the report or on a score, decisions are being made about you and it's being made on inaccurate information, that's not good. Especially if it's inaccurate information that's negative. Um, uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires that um, when a consumer um, is turned down or receives a worse offer uh, with, certain, with respect to certain key decisions, that they have to be notified that that um, decision was made based on negative information in their credit report. So if you are turned down for a job, if you get a loan that is more expensive than it otherwise would have been, if you don't get accepted for a housing, for like a ten as a tenant or to be a renter, um, or you're turned down for insurance, or your insurance rate is higher um, than it otherwise would be based on a credit report, you have to be given that information. And that is also an important tool. So when the consumer actually is hurt, unfortunately, it is sort of after at least that first incident. incident. But when a consumer is hurt, they then can find out, well, it was because of information in and then they can go and look at it and see whether it was accurate or not. In fact, that's what happened back in Vermont way, way back when. Consumers found out that they were not getting um, those loans because of information in their credit report. They just couldn't figure out what it was. So, yeah, it's a really underutilized tool. Um, it is incredibly important. 
you know, there have been services that um, credit reporting agencies have now adopted, just freecreditscore.com, right? We all know about that. Free credit report, it used to be freecreditreport.com, now it's freecreditscore.com, where you can actually see the score and not, not the credit report. As far as the actual formula and yeah. how it's computed yeah. to get that number? It's like well, the, a mystery. Formula, the formula is different than the number. You can get the number now. Yeah. It used to be that you couldn't get the number. You would just get some generic number as opposed to numbers that actually any retailer or bank or credit credit entity um, looked at. But the formula, yeah, you don't get that. And then as far as discrepancies, I've had to deal with that once. That's a nightmare. It is a nightmare. Trying to get something fixed and because you have to deal with three credit reporting exactly. agencies, not just one, and. As bad as it, as difficult as it was for you now, you here in law school, so imagine first of all how the ordinary consumer deals with that. That's one thing. But it was really bad before the amendments to the law. I mean, um, the amendments did make this process uh, uh, easier um, to a great extent. But I completely have the case with you. Yeah. Um, what effects have the Dodd Frank and the creation of the CFPB had on the FTC? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm talking about privacy here. That's what I spent most of my time talking about. But we also do a tremendous amount of dealing with um, loans, debt relief, uh, debt collection, all sorts of financial services. And Dodd-Frank, of course, created the Bureau. The, we call it the Bureau, the, the, the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is designed to focus on very, some of those very same issues. The, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is also designed to oversee financial institutions, that is banks, savings and loans, things like that, with respect to their compliance with consumer protection laws. But in the non-bank non area, with respect to debt collection, fair, with respect to credit reporting agencies, with respect to payday lenders, uh, student loan um, companies, um, these are areas where the FTC and the new Bureau will be sharing jurisdiction and we will both be involved in enforcement. And in addition to the Bureau and the FTC, the State Attorneys General also have jurisdiction in these areas. So I think the, the feeling um, by Congress and others was we didn't have enough cops on the beat, which was one of the problems many, many problems that led to the Great Recession and meltdown. But it, one of the problems was not having enough cops, cops on the beat. So now we're going to have several cops on the beat dealing with some of these issues. So now a non-student. Yes. And, and a, different, a different direction. Um, You're totally fine. So um, you mentioned Europe. And yes. in Europe, as, as well as elsewhere in the world, um, agencies like yours have become involved in looking at the legal profession and mm -hmm. competition in the legal profession, promoting competition sure. in the legal profession. So I'm, I'm curious about whether your agency has considered that as a topic of, uh, of investigation. Well, tell me which efforts you're thinking about in Europe and elsewhere. So in the UK, for example, uh -huh. the Competition Authority took on, really took on the legal profession, uh -huh. um, starting in the Thatcher administration, uh -huh. and now is uh, heavily involved in it, they've changed the regulation of the legal profession so that it's not a self-regulatory organization anymore. So um, we haven't done the legal profession, but we have focused in on other professions. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the, the real estate industry is one that we, focus, we have focused mm -hmm. in on a lot, and the multi, um, multi, multiple listing services, mm -hmm. and whether or not entities that would not agree to a certain um, uh, cut for the for their own company mm -hmm. weren't, weren't agreeing to six percent, but were willing to take four percent. They were being shut out of MLS services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we brought those actions, saying that that was a competition problem. People should be able to charge less and still participate in these services mm -hmm. of, or these listings, these multiple listing services. So that was a big effort on our part to deal with the real estate um, uh, profession. Other professions that we've been spending a lot of time on are the healthcare professions. Because we, um, in the competition world, there, in addition to the Federal Trade Commission doing competition work, the US Department of Justice also does competition work. And we've kind of divided up the world by subject um, area, and we do healthcare. 
generally speaking. They do they do insurance, which obviously also involves healthcare. But we do hospitals, we do doctors, we do a lot of that. And there's been a lot of activity at the state legislative level to but, but on, on behalf of licensed doctors, um, licensed dentists, mm -hmm. uh, those who are um, <coughs> anesthesiologists and others, to um, disallow um, those who don't have that same license but are doing similar practices mm -hmm. at a much lower rate mm -hmm. to be engaged in that practice. So we've been very focused on that issue. Mm -hmm. Um, we just so we do a lot of stuff with professions. We just haven't focused on the profession. Um, I have two very disparate questions. The first is going back to do not track. Um, what if any involvement or voice has the law enforcement community had in discussing the ability of consumers to control that sort of tracking if they are relying on data from private entities in the course of their duties are they just getting those data some other way that we don't necessarily know much about, but if, but if they are relying on companies, right. um, do, they, do they care about this? Or they, um, the answer is, with respect to do not track, um, we have not, I, I do not believe we've heard a lot from law enforcement having any concern about this, because this tracking is really being used for marketing purposes. Um, it also can be used for other purposes, and so you know, it might be that down the road they find that the services that they do use, um, uh, whether they're skip tracing services, this is law enforcement, that law enforcement uses skip tracing services or other um, identity verification services, things like that. Um, it's possible that they might have some, it could have some effect from do, not, from do Not Track, but we really haven't been hearing that concern. We do hear that some of our proposals around, some of my personal proposals around data brokers and the data broker industry, which is different than Do Not Track, but the data, with respect to data brokers, that they they do offer services to law enforcement, like identity verification and some of this, uh, this other stuff. And law enforcement hasn't come to us. That is, I mean, we're law enforcement, but the criminal law enforcement guys, right? The guys who carry guns, right? We don't, we don't get to carry guns. Never have. <laughs> um, but the guys who carry guns, you know, haven't come to us and said, oh, you're going to hurt our ability to find the bad guys. But on their behalf, data brokers have said, you're going to hurt the ability of law enforcement to get this information. Mm -hmm. We'll see, you know, we'll see where all this shippers have. Mm -hmm. uh, my other uh, sure. Uh, sure. disparate question is, um, has to do with nonprofit entities and the FTC's jurisdiction over nonprofits. Yep. And uh, the scope of it now, where that might will sure. that change in the future, and will we ever get a do not call this list that finally covers mm -hmm. annoying nonprofits and politicians? Well, we so the, the trouble. So, um, I, on the latter part of your question about a do not call list that covers um, nonprofits and um, political speech, that's going to be more difficult probably because of the First Amendment. Um, uh, but um, and and for for a variety of of other reasons. Um, it is true that generally speaking the Federal Trade Commission does not, we do not have jurisdiction over charities. Um, the state AGs do have jurisdiction over charities. Um, there is a lot of discussion in, uh, in certain areas of giving um, the FTC jurisdiction over charities and whether that will happen through legislation that's currently being thought about in terms of the baseline privacy or, or something else, I, I don't know. But there is discussion about that. There's an exception to the to that rule that we don't generally cover nonprofits, and that's in the hospital arena. We do focus on hospital activity, especially merger activity involving nonprofit hospitals. But generally speaking, we don't really, um, focus on the activities of nonprofits. I, it, 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 sure, let's go to you. I, I just want to make sure that everybody gets a chance. So yeah. So I'm not actually a lawyer, I'm a security researcher, and you said earlier that consumers shouldn't have to go to law school to understand the privacy policy, which is something I really agree with. But it was my, and again, I don't have any legal education, it was my impression that ignorance of the law is no excuse. So I, I'm, I'm being serious. You know, but. It is, that's, that's, so I was, that's I was, the rules, yeah. But what I was wondering is then how can you, what is the legal basis to, to be able to say that when somebody's given a contract or a privacy policy, how can you say that that's misleading without leaving someone open to the defense that 
Well, there's a, so um, first of all, our proposal to have simpler choice and clear notices is a best practices proposal. We're not saying that the failure nece that necessarily the failure to do that is deceptive. But there are lots of circumstances where you, if you say one thing up front, like in like in an ad, you say, let's say, just, you know, this car is going to cost you ten thousand dollars. But then in mouse print later on, or when the consumer is signing the contract, you say, well, really, it's going to cost fifteen thousand dollars, not not ten thousand dollars, or whatever number I said. Yeah, you know, that's deceptive. Even though it's there, and you could have read it in the mouse print, or you, maybe if you had understood the way the math, the way they've done it. That's not allowed. You can't sort of say one thing and bring consumers into your shop saying one thing and then take it away later on. So that's one of those other fundamental principles, like ignorance of the law is no is no excuse. So, and that ignorance of the law is no excuse. That really is. It, it's much well. <laughs> I was going to say it's, like, it's much more of a principle for criminal law than it is for civil law. But um, but uh, but so 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 again, we're, what I've been talking about that framework that we about privacy is I'm not saying that, that failure to do the things that we're recommending would mean we'll bring an action against companies. It's not that they'll violate the law, but they won't be living up to best practices. So that's the, that's the framework we're looking at. And again, it might be something that Congress wants to take a look at in terms of developing a law that would require those things. Commissioner, can I jump in here to of suggest course, that? Of course. Um, we have a reception upstairs, okay. and so those of you who still have questions, and I see that there are a number of you, there'll be an opportunity to ask your questions there for those absolutely. people who have to get on to something else. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you, and if you all would join me in thank you.